The Yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. To New York, to New York. With the Yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. To New York, to New York. And welcome to Crash Chords Autographs. Today, Matt welcomes Graham Elwood, a comedian, documentarian, and podcast host. Known as a stand-up comedian and as host of the Comedy Film Nerds podcast, co-hosted by Chris Mancini, Graham is a pillar figure in the podcasting community. He is credited as one of the creators of a podcast festival in L.A. called L.A. Podfest. Graham also has an interest in making documentaries. His most recent documentary was about his time performing for the soldiers in Afghanistan, aptly called Afghanistan. In addition, he has been working on a documentary about podcasting called Earbuds. Matt and Graham chat about his influences in the world of comedy and how music grew to play a larger role in his adulthood. His last comedy album, Palm Strike Dance Party, features a song at the end created with the help of former guest Mike Furman. They also step into a hefty discussion on the many branches of the podcasting industry and how it has changed the face of entertainment as a whole. And so, here's welcoming Matt Storm and Graham Elwood. Hello. Hi, Graham. It's Matt. Hey, Matt. How are you, man? Good. How are you? Good. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me a bit. No problem, my friend. Yeah, I thought a landline might be a little better. My cell service in this hotel is a little off. Oh, no, I appreciate that. Considering it's a phone interview, whenever the phone connection is not great, it makes for a difficult uh, reconstruction of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm, of course, a big fan of your comedy and of comedy film nerds. Uh, in fact, that podcast is one of the reasons I started the two podcasts I do now. Um, comedy film nerds, obviously, I don't need to tell you what your podcast is. You know, you do it. But um, for the listeners, the the fact that you guys break apart these movies but don't hold back and you know, if they deserve being pissed all over, you do it, but explain why analytically, because you love movies and you know movies. And um, my other podcast besides the interview show is a weekly album review show, a music podcast. And the idea to do an analytical music show that's two hours long, breaking it down track by track, was because of your show, essentially. That I was like, oh, if, that's awesome, man. if people are going to listen to someone talk about movies, for an hour, hour and a half, why can't I talk about music for that long, you know? so. And I'm sure there's people out there that want to hear it. Yeah, and I mean, and uh, LA Podfest Fest is an awesome thing, which I'm hoping to make it to at some point. Ever since I first started hearing you guys talk about it, I was like, oh, that's a brilliant idea. A podcast festival where podcasters can go and record other podcasters. It makes yeah, it's, perfect sense. It's so much fun, man. September 18th through the 20th this year, if you can make it. We just put tickets on sale at LAPodfest.com, and so, it's such a blast. We had 35 shows last year and five panels, and then we have the the lab where last year was the Squarespace lab. They sponsored it where smaller podcasts um, that weren't uh, officially programmed in the festival could go in there and get interviews. So you have these little, you know, little podcasts with, you know, a handful of followers getting interviews with Todd Glass and Aisha Tyler and and all that. So it's, it's pretty amazing. That's awesome. And like, as someone who's just starting to gather steam and get some good interviews, it's like, that's a great opportunity for someone who may not have all the connections or a way to reach out or, you know, those people who you want to reach out to want to do those interviews, but they're very busy and it's hard for them to make the time sometimes. So it's a yeah, cool thing. It's also, more than likely, it's going to be interviews like, you know, you, you have to get interviews over the phone, like, which is fine. But, you know, to get them in person there at the festival, it's, it's, there's something kind of exciting about that. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so so my main show is a uh, music podcast. And this, this interview show uh, has mainly been with musicians. You're my first non-musician guest. So thank you for adding variety to my awesome show with your <laughs> awesomeness. Um, but... I mean, to say you're not in a band is not true because you are in the Whistling Bane, let's uh, not forget. Well, yeah, I mean, that's probably the single greatest rock band to ever exist in the history of the human race. It's true. I'm a little disappointed you guys haven't gone on tour yet, but I understand. You're focusing on comedy now. I get it, you know. Well, 
We're putting together a, a mega tour that's <laughs> going to be um, all the giant arenas throughout the world, and we're, we're just waiting to lock down the International Space Station. So <laughs> those dates are going to be released pretty soon. Um, <laughs> It's just I, the the Bane, the guys in my band, you know, they're all super villains. So the the writer for the type of space shuttle we're going to need, that's just, you know, we got to let the the agents and the lawyers iron that out. But it'll happen. It'll happen. <laughs> uh, the the reason I actually brought that up is because I, I had my first question was going to be, are you ever surprised doing podcasting, like Doug's podcast, your podcast, any podcast? The jokes you make that get legs, like, do they ever truly surprise you which jokes actually get legs and become a huge thing? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 that kind of stuff um, is is so fun to me. And so, like, the whistling thing, I just have always whistled on the show really loudly, and some people love it. Some people hate it on Douglas movies, and then, you know, we've been doing the Bane impression for whatever, three years now. Yeah. And... <laughs> that just came out of nowhere. I think Doug was pissed at me. I was whistling too much on a show. And he was like, all right, get your plugs out and then get out of here. And I was like, well, my band, the Whistling Bangs, <laughs> and it's just, I was just saying it to be a dick. And then all the fans on Twitter were just like, when are the Whistling Bangs on tour? Where can I get their album? What's right. going on? <laughs> like, I was just a guest on Crab Feast. Uh-huh. And, uh, which is a, it's a really awesome show with Ryan Sickler and Jay Larson. And uh, they were in the festival last year. And they're also, we're, both of our shows are on all things comedy. And so I, I don't know those guys that well, but they're like, hey, love to have you come on the show. And they basically just say, come up with four or five kind of crazy stories, and the wilder the better. And then they're just, you're just sort of talking. And, and just so what was high school like? And I was like, oh, I used to get in a lot of trouble. And all of a sudden I talk about when I was 15, I broke into a house. And. And I'm like, this is crazy. And then Ryan goes, you know, 11 minutes in, or I had to get you cop and do a B and E. Let's go. The last episode dropped, I think, yesterday. Mm -hmm. All over Twitter has just been hashtag B and E. Of course. <laughs> Which I just think is so, is so fun. I just that's the thing I love about podcasting is what the fans just grab onto and they they won't let go of, like. On Comedy Film Nerds, we started, one time I was, this is about a year ago, uh, David Huntsberger was our guest, and he was talking about the movie Carrie, that remake, and I had just yeah. literally had flown back from, I had done a tour through Asia or something, I was just fried, and so I was just trying to stay awake, and he's talking about Carrie, and he's like, yeah, overall, it's a pretty good movie. And then, you know, it's like, all right, time to move on to the next movie. And I went, okay, Carrie, guys, work it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and David and Chris go, what? Work it? What are you talking about? I just start laughing. We're all just, and then it just becomes a riff of, like, work, this movie's a work it, that's a leave it. So now hashtag work it has been, like, on it for a year. And then we add... You know, like one of our sponsors was Sherry's Berries. So we're like, it's a berry work it. It's a, you know, it's a any. So I just, I don't know. I love, love, love that stuff. Um. So since the the main show that I do is a music uh, podcast, I, while we can always, of course, talk about comedy all night, I actually wanted to ask you about some of the bands that you're really into now and stuff you grew up listening to, because I always find it interesting when you speak to people who aren't necessarily playing music, but what music they like, um, it's always unique because it could be anything. Is there a favorite band you're really listening to a lot now or just bands that you've always listened to growing up? Well, it's kind of weird because I was never a big music person growing up. Like mm -hmm. I'm the youngest before my brother and two older sisters were always into like buying the new album and getting tickets to the shows. And I just, I, for some reason I never really, was into that i don't know i just didn't but any of the concerts i went to like college or in my even my 20s it was usually just somebody say i got an extra ticket to this thing and i go cool and i'm like oh, this is fun you know <laughs> like, i mean you know uh in college i of course liked u2 and pearl jam and sure. uh you know stuff like that but then this last you know what has it been now seven years of kind of in 2008, I started going back on the road pretty hard as a comedian. Mm -hmm. And being on the road hard, several things happened. First of all, 
I was like, you know, I didn't have much, I wasn't going out because I was just doing shows. And then when I would come home, I'd be like, well, I don't want to go anywhere. I just want to sit in my apartment. And I was like, well, I got to do something about this. So I really liked, I'm like, well, let's go see live music. And then I also had the benefit of um, working some of these rock and roll cruises. Um, like I did the 311 cruise, sure. the Weezer cruise. And then I got hooked into this, a bunch of them. I did like the Kiss cruise and the, you know, the rock boat and all this stuff. And what, what happened on that was I think I turned on all these cool bands, like, like, you know, smaller mid-level bands um, that I really love, like sleeper agent. They have mm-hmm. their second album came out last year. I love those guys are great. Yeah. We've seen them live on the road. Um, so we kind of friends with them, which is fun because, That's cool. you know, we like get off stage and then, you know, run across town in some city and <laughs> go check out them. Um, which is which is fun. There's a cool band called uh, A Thousand Horses out of Nashville. Um, actually, two good bands I love out of Nashville. There's A Thousand Horses and this band called Bone Pony um, that I did some rock, some of those rock cruises on. They're just fun guys, and their shows were fun. Um, there's um, there's a band out of San Francisco called Junk Parlor. Um, that my cousin's in and they've been, they played in LA. And so whenever, you know, I've just been lucky that whenever they've been in LA, I've had a, I've been home or had a couple of nights off and I go see them play. And it's just like, I've just sort of really have now become kind of a music fan more than I ever was. And also the, when I got an iPhone like five years ago and, and all this flying, I bought really nice noise canceling headphones and um, you know, Shazam and iTunes make it really easy to just buy albums. And so I'm just, one of the things I do when I fly is I listen to music, which was something I never used to do. I was never like a, let's, you know, I just have whatever the radio on in the car or something sure. like that. So now I'm sort of really enjoying learning and finding new bands. And I got to go see, um, Dave Grohl had his birthday party at the, at the forum in LA last month. And, you know, so it's just, he was like, Hey, it's Dave Pearl with the Foo Fighters. And then I'm going to bring along a bunch of my friends who are going to come play with me. And it was like, <laughs> okay. Paul Stanley and David Lee Roth. And <laughs> just like, wow. Which was, which is amazing. And, and so that's kind of the cool thing of living in LA is like, there's all these really talented people. And so now like going to live music and finding new albums to download and listen to is kind of a thing I'm, I'm really into. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I find that the accessibility of being able to pull up a band anywhere online, either Bandcamp or iTunes or wherever, and just listen to it and then purchase it, like, it's a no-brainer for me. Like, it just makes it so accessible. And you can hear so much different stuff now. You know, with YouTube, you just look up a band, pull up their music video and go, oh, I like this. All right, I'll go look into more of it. Yeah. I don't know how many times I'm, like, in a store and I'm like, what is this? This is amazing. And when I first got turned on to Shazam, yeah. I was like, What? And now I'm like, what is this? And I'm just sitting there shazamming it going, oh, I'm in. I want it. Give me the album. (laughs) Yeah. No, yeah, and it's great. A good thing for the music business. I mean, I know obviously in the late 90s and everything, they really were having a hard time financially. And it's it's come back a little bit with because it's so easy to just buy something. Yeah. I mean, obviously people are going online and getting their shit for free or whatever. but, But still, though, they're still getting money from from uh, Pandora and all that. Like, I really like Pandora too. Um, and I, and I know from having comedy albums on Pandora that you get paid when your stuff plays. So I feel like supporting the music and cause as an artist, I know what it's like, you know, and everybody in this day and age just wants everything for free. And it's like, well, <laughs> like, how am I supposed to, <laughs> how am I supposed to eat if all, if my soul, you know, if everything I do is free. Yeah, sure. So I try to support it on, on the consumer end as well. Well, that's like the first thing I'll do if I befriend a band or if I go see a show. It's like once they put out a new thing, I go, where can I go to buy it? Then you'll get the biggest cut and the industry will take the least from you because I want you to get money. You know, you do this art and I want you to get it because the, the the fact that people put stuff out for free, you know, I mean, like podcasting, it's a big thing. Like 90% of the podcasts are free. There are some that can manage a 
paid system that works, but most of them are free because it's just people want all this free content now, you know, they, they're just used to it. It's the way it is. Yeah. And it's like, everybody's had to kind of figure out, I mean, you know, the, the getting advertisers on the podcast has been helpful to us at comedy filmers and a bunch of those shows. Yeah. Um, and the thing for comedians, you know, podcasting has, you know, everyone's like, how do you monetize? How do you monetize? And, and aside from like you said, a direct subscription model, you know, there's advertising, but then as comedians, you really benefit from building up the fan base and getting them to come out and buy tickets to the shows. Yeah. Um, which is really what the music industry had to do. Yeah. You know, when everyone was getting their albums for free, they went, okay, we're going on the road. Like everyone's going on the road and everyone's selling merch after their shows. <laughs> yeah, sure. And like every artist I talk to, it's like they have a list of dates. And it's like, so what are you up to next? And like, oh, well, I'm playing here and here and here and here because they want to get the info out, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's interesting to watch the, the industry navigate the model. I mean, I, for me, as someone who loves comedy, like I honestly hadn't known your comedy until you were a guest. I think it was on the Nerdist podcast and I'd heard you on there and I went, oh, this guy's hilarious. Oh, he's got a comedy album. Oh, he's got his own podcast. And you know, and then it just snowballs from there. It really has lended to the, I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of model when you have people on your show and, and you're on someone else's show. Well, that's the cool thing, too, and I think the podcast listener always wants to find the new cool thing. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know, just specifically with comedy filmers, we love talking about some movie that we didn't know we just found or when a fan says, oh, you got to check out this indie film and, you know, it's on DOD or Netflix or something like that. Um, and I love that, you know, knowing that's how people like you have people have found me as I'm a guest on some podcast and then they start looking me up. That's why we like having new guests on our show because I want to turn, you know, when I find someone that's funny and creative, be they a comedian or filmmaker or whatever, I want, I want other people to know who they are. And that to me is the, is the upside of all of this, this social media and digital technology is then you can kind of just find anyone and become a fan of them. You know, I hosted, two different game shows. I did over 300 episodes of TV and I never had a fan base until I started doing a podcast and being a guest on podcasts and going on the road and having Twitter and Facebook and all that. Yeah. I mean, social media has changed the landscape. I mean, like what we're doing right now, this is going to be a podcast. And even five or six years ago, you couldn't really do this. Like the technology was just so terrible. Like unless you owned a radio station, how are you going to do a phone interview? But right, right. but now I have an app that runs on my phone in the background, and as soon as the call opens, it records it. And What's the app? So it's just called Call Recorder. It's an Android app, and there were some bugs in the beginning, like um, the guest often was a lot lower than me, so then now I just hold the phone a little further from my face, and so I don't sound so overwhelmingly loud, and it evens out. But. Uh -huh. I mean, other than that, it's worked really great. It converts it, it immediately converts it to a WAV file when you end the call and you save it and you just pop it on the computer. I pop my theme song on the front end, a little advertisement for all the other stuff we do on my website on the other end and then put it up. Nice. And it's, and it's great. And it's like, I, I, within the last five years, I've been listening to guys like you and Chris and then Chris Hardwick and like Mark Marin, all these guys who did interview shows. And I'm like, I want to do that. I mean, and I have some talented friends who do music or do this or do that or burlesque, whatever. Well, maybe people want to listen to us chat and it's so far worked really great. And it's just really cool. That's awesome. Where are you located? I'm in New York. Oh, cool. And so like I have, I've been into music since I could walk pretty much. And uh, I've, listen to music a lot and you know i created a website as a blog when blogs were a thing i mean they still are but like when blogs were just becoming a thing i created a dot com and just started writing about music and people started to read it a little bit and i was like one of my friends was like you listen to 30 podcasts why are you not making a podcast what's wrong with you like <laughs> and i was like oh i guess i should make one and that's how the first show started which is the weekly album review show it's me and two other guys and we just, we, we dissect an album weekly. We talk about a music topic weekly. And then at the end of every month, we'll have a guest come into the quote unquote studio, which is my dining room. And For we'll have a, month. we'll have a, we'll have a guest on and they're local musicians, local performers, 
you know, any, or if it's someone passing through anyone I can get on, you know, and it's a start and it's a lot of fun. That's great. Um, and it's all because of the technology. If the technology wasn't here, like we wouldn't be able to do any of this. Well, that's the thing. Like when we, you know, we're in post-production on, um, earbuds the podcasting yeah. documentary and that was the coolest well one of there's many cool things but that was one of the coolest things about it was interviewing all these fans literally all over the world you know the yeah. u.s and we went to australia and japan and all these people with all these completely different backgrounds you know that just would have what would, they would have nothing in common at all yeah and then because of top podcasting they can they can they can share this interest in you know in comedy film nerds and other you know Douglas movies and all these other shows, Mark Marin and 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 it's literally connecting people all, all over the face of the earth with this technology that didn't exist. I mean, cool, like you know you can video chat with somebody on your phone on the other side of the planet. Yeah, and that was like Star Trek technology when I was a kid. Oh yeah, exactly. That was like, oh, that's crazy. And now, literally, you, I mean, I've I video chat with people in, in you know, I've done it in China and Japan, and it's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's like, it, no matter and no matter what your audience is, you never know who'll find you once you're on the internet. Like a band that I've become friends with is named Godsticks. They're this great prog rock band, really heavy, awesome stuff. They're in England. A fan of theirs found our podcast where we reviewed their album and told the band. And then the band reached out to us. That's so cool. And now That's a couple of the band members follow me on Twitter. Like, I'll forget and I'll post, oh, I need coffee today. And like the lead singer will respond, oh, me too. And I'll be like, what? <laughs> you know? And it's, and like now they have a new album coming out and he's been sending me emails. They did a long email interview with us that I posted up as an article on the site because doing a phone conversation with the seven hour difference is difficult, but like, it's just, you forget what the reach is because right. of this technology. And it's sometimes it's just jaw dropping. It is, man. It is. It is so fascinating to me when I, I did a tour, a stand up comedy tour through um, like Hong Kong and China and oh, wow. last uh, August and September. And you know, was performing all over the place, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, uh, all these venues around Hong Kong. And, you know, every show had at least a couple of comedy film nerd fans. You know, yeah. it's just like I was in Guangzhou, China, and these people were like, oh, my God, we listen every week. And it's so great. It's the only English we hear. And, <laughs> and you're just like, it's it's mind boggling. Yeah. It's just mind boggling. So. Um, uh, to bring it back around to music a bit, I do want to talk about your crazy dance hit, uh, Palm Strike Dance Party, the album of the same name. So how did the, how, so I don't remember if the origin was said on Comedy Film Nerds or if I, I just don't remember, but I guess let's say for the audience, how did the Palm Strike Dance Party thing and Palm, the Palm Strike thing start? I can't well, that I have a chance to the origin of the album on Comedy Film Nerds, but, um, well, the Palm Strike thing just was a thing in my act. I started studying martial arts a while ago, and and I was in, uh, you know, my karate class, and I went from a white to a yellow belt, and then they put like a stripe on my yellow belt, and then a second one, and then that night I was performing at the Improv in Hollywood, huh? and my instructor and a couple guys from class were at the show, and I just made a joke. I said I'm a second degree yellow belt in karate, <laughs> and they just started laughing. And I was like, I know how to palm strike. So that just became like this big thing in my act. Um, you know, I'm always palm striking stuff. And so I did my first album called The Comedian's Got a Boo Boo. Sure. And after, which, was, which was fun. It was cool. And Rooftop Comedy put it out. And afterwards, several people went, how come your album isn't called Palm Strike? I was like, <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's a great idea. <laughs> so um, I decided to... I wanted to make a, uh, I just, I was on the road doing shows with Doug Benson and Nikki Glazer, and we mm -hmm. were like driving, and I think Doug was in the back asleep, and Nikki and I were just, we, we were playing like local radio stations, and we were doing all these like dance songs, and we just kept laughing how every dance song was the same. Yeah. You know, always same lyrics, get on the dance floor before the party stops, and whatever, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, and I just kind of had this idea, like, I want to make a stupid dance song and put it as a bonus track on my next album. And so I had recorded the album 
at um, Go Bananas in Cincinnati, which is a great club. And then there was like some delays with it, like from a technical standpoint, this one record label was going to do it and they couldn't. And so I was like, was, so the, the album was just sort of sitting there. And in the meantime, I was like, well, let's, and I called um, uh, Mark Furman, who mm-hmm. did Hard and Firm sure. with Chris Hartwick. He was a guest uh, last week. It hasn't aired oh. yet, but I recorded with him about a week ago. Yeah, he's awesome. And I said, dude, I want to oh, do this wonderful. cheesy dance song. <laughs> He was like, oh, come on over. And he's got like a little studio in his sure. garage. And we just spent a couple days. And I said, I kind of want this. And this, you know, like um, the Britney Spears, you know, keep on dancing till the world ends. Like, I kind of want it like that, you know, with lasers. And I want to have some sort of spaceship <laughs> element to it or something like that. <laughs> and he just was like, oh, you got it. Like, he didn't look at me and go, what are you of fucking course, talking right. about? Because I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a musician, so I can't tell you, like, tempo or notes or anything. I'm just sort of like. <laughs> I want to sound like, like this. Yeah. Bear, 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 bear. You know, like, that's like <laughs> the extent of my music ability. So, <laughs> and he was like, let's do it. So he started coming down with some tracks, and I was like, oh, this is awesome, and just made little tweaks. And then we brought Natasha Lajaro in there to do sure. the vocal. I was like, I go, we need her to be Fergie. I wanted, um, uh. I was trying to get Nikki Glaser, but she was in New York and I live in LA. Right. Couldn't make it happen. But then I was like, oh, Natasha. Natasha was great. <laughs> yeah. She came into his studio for just a couple hours and just vamped it up. <laughs> oh, keep on on track. And like she just vamped it up. <laughs> so we just laid down all of her tracks and then. Uh, Mike put them all together. And then I was like, Palm Strike Dance Party. I go, well, that's the name of the album. And then. Uh, I decided I just called up Matt Belknap at a special thing records. And I said, Matt, like I got this album. I just like, let's, I just need this thing done. It's been sitting there. It's been, like delayed by nine months. Um, so let's do this. I go, I don't think it needs much editing, but you know, tell me what you think. And, and then Ryan, his partner, we went over it and I said, I said, album cover. I want it to look like one of those. <laughs> dance like edm GC sure like those greatest album. hits like yeah, yeah like best dance songs of the last 20 years thing yeah exactly and so uh, we did a you know a photo shoot at um at the ucb theater lizelle estepona who shot a lot of stuff over there shot it and then they they glammed up the cover <laughs> like i look i don't know 10 years younger <laughs> thing. Like, it's just it's so ridiculous and they put, I love, they put the the mirror ball. Yeah. And and then I was like, there's a bonus dance song, and I just love it. And I had it turned into a um, a ringtone on iTunes. So oh, any nice. of my listeners wanted as a ringtone. That's amazing. <laughs> and, um, you know, I try to, when I'm like headlining a club, I try to have that song play as the show ends. Like when I say oh, yeah. night and everyone's filing out, I play that song. Nice. And... And then we did, we were like, well, we got to do a video. I said to my buddy, we got to do a music video. Sure. <laughs> so we did, so really the song and the music video kind of came almost before the album. That's funny. Yeah. That's really great. And I'm not surprised to hear that Mike Furman was involved in something so ridiculous because he's hilarious and oh. got, he, got he a great... that song, man. I mean, he just like, I just gave him like some parameters and he was like, how about this? And I was like, that's great. Yeah, yeah. He, I want I want to do a whole I want to do more music paired stuff with him. Like, oh I yeah, want to do a Christmas album with him for next year. Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, when we were talking, well, first of all, so Mike Furman was like the first interview I ever had. We did a Skype interview that I transcribed because the podcasting was like out of my realm of creating at the time. He remembers me from that interview. He were, he's a, a sweetheart, and so when like I called him, it's like catching up with an old friend. And his biggest complaint over the last couple of years, not complaint, is that he has no time. And so like he puts out a song at a time because he's got two wonderful kids and they take up a lot of his time. And I just want him to put out another album because I want to share it with the world. I want to review it on my podcast and tell them how amazing it is. I know it will be because he's a funny dude. It's he's, he's one of these guys. It's like, I don't, I like you, you just want more people to know how, talented he is he's so funny yeah 
and so skilled musically and has these just great ideas. He's just one of those guys I, I just want to keep working with and go, Mike, what about this? And just kind of let him go. Just like paint yeah. this sort of mild outline and go, go, Mike. What do you think with that? <laughs> just because he'll come back with something that I never would have thought of. He was one of those guys also who's not just the musician and not just the comedian. Like he really does meld the genres together. He does do very funny but talented music, which is not common unless you're Weird Al. You know, it's not always easy to find that kind of stuff out in the market. Right. Yeah, he comes up with really inventive stuff that's not just sort of wacky songs. Like they're yeah. they're, they're they're pretty smart and and that's what I like about it. Um, did you ever, at, and you said you didn't grow up really listening to a lot of music, but did you ever have any desire to do anything besides comedy? I mean, I know you said you hosted for a while and you only kind of hit comedy really hard again within the last decade, but were there other jobs you wanted to do before you said, I'm going to be a comedian? Well, it's kind of, I mean, I actually, I started doing stand up when I was 18 uh -huh. in college and then I was in a sketch group. So it's really, I've always been in like entertainment in one form or another. And I just always known it was probably that. I mean, there was a couple of times I was like, Oh, maybe I'm going to join the fire department or something. <laughs> um, but really, you know, before I, you know, 2008, I was going on the road, maybe 10 weeks a year. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was always, I've always been a comic. I always considered myself one, but was like doing other things. I was hosting and I had like some, a short film I made and was taken it to festivals and I did some plays in LA and stand up was just sort of something I always just kind of had going on. And it was in 08 where I just kind of had an opportunity with Doug Benson to just start going back on the road hard and kind of just go, well, it was mainly like it was kind of a financial decision, like this other stuff sort of I'd made the documentary uh, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and that took a lot of time and a lot of money and and that was really kind of hard financially and emotionally making that film, and so it was like, I gotta go make money, so let's just go on the road. you know Doug was like hey he he was kind of you know his star was kind of rising, he's like, I got all these headline dates, Graham, if you want to come out open for me, let's do this." And so I just kind of took that opportunity. But I think it's always been really, it's always been just in show business. Like I like, you know, somebody asked me recently, like, oh, Graham, if you had your, what would your dream job be? I go, well, it's this, <laughs> doing it. Like yeah. just make a little more money, like have a little more <laughs> financial security. But, <laughs> you know, I'm in post-production on another feature film I directed. That's um, awesome. I get to talk movies every week with buddies. Yeah. I, I help run a festival. I tell jokes. I'm, you know, it's just like I'm telling jokes. I'm making movies. I'm, you know, the Podfest is just a three day party. It's just like a reunion of all the, my funny friends and all these great fans. So it's really just, I'm doing it. You know, I'm getting awesome. paid to travel around the world. I get paid to watch movies and make them. <laughs> you know, I'm living the dream. Lucky. I'm, yeah, it's I'm I'm blessed, you know. I've been doing this my entire adult life, so I really have no other skill set outside of this. So, you know, <laughs> it's a good thing it worked out. Yeah, I, yeah, I kind of need to make this happen. <laughs> um, I want to also take a moment to talk a little bit about movies, since you're obviously a movie guy. No secret with comedy film nerds being as awesome of a podcast as it is. Um, but I want to also relate it to music a bit. Have you ever seen a movie that the soundtrack was so awful? Or incredible that it changed your opinion of the movie. Man, God, there was a movie that came out last year. I remember seeing that. I can't remember the film off the top of my head. But I must say, you know, since I've been like becoming more of a music fan, I'm definitely paying more attention mm -hmm. to soundtracks when yeah. I listen to feature films, or when, excuse me, when I watch them. Yeah. Um, oh, there was some movie. Dang it! What was it? I can't think of something off the top of my head. Well, I'll tell you, you know, like, um, I'll give you an example of a film where the soundtrack um, was, to me, accentuated, the, like, enhanced the movie, mm -hmm. made it better. And I just watched this um, recently on cable, Into the Wild, um, where uh, Sean Penn directed it and mm -hmm. it based on that true story, and he yeah. hired Eddie Vedder to kind of write original music for it. 
and which it's fit because you know it was about this real guy it took place in the early 90s so this kid was right out of college in that time of like you know pearl jam's heyday but it sure. wasn't pearl jam songs and eddie vetter captured he almost felt like it was you know this movie was based on this a person wrote a book on this this kid's diary you know and you kind of just felt like musically eddie vetter was just bringing this kid's journal, this kid's life, you know, to light with music. If yeah. that makes sense. No, yeah, totally. And I mean, it's not foreign to see a film that does that. I mean, there are films where the soundtrack kind of is just there. And then there are others that they couldn't possibly exist. Like my favorite example is imagine the opening crawl in star Wars, any of them. Right. And then take away the John Williams score. Yeah. I mean, you would yeah. kill the movie. It would be the most right. boring thing ever. Yeah, there's like a long time ago in Galaxy Far From Away, it's just like boom, 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 or something. You'd be like, oh, this movie's going to blow. Yeah. You know, it's it's something like that. It's like, it, it, it's really incredible the power music can have in a film. And I always love that. Like a good soundtrack and an action sequence too. Like, you know, the scoring for any comic book movie that has like a giant battle if the music's not as intense as the the fighting you kind of get lost yeah that's that's a great point there is the times when they get too much with the music or the sound effects where um you know we were having this discussion on we've had this discussion on a couple episodes of comedy film nerds where um i remember we had david feldman on and he was saying you know i'm a big wes anderson fan oh yeah i love his stuff yeah, I love his stuff, and I love, you know, he usually works with Mark, Mark Mothersbaugh and sure. who makes some of the music and also selects certain songs, and I really like that. And Feldman was saying he, he didn't enti- entirely like some of those films because he feels like the director's telling him what emotions to have with this mm. uh, song. Um, to where I'm like, I, I mean, I see that point, but I'm sort of like, well, that's sort of the director's job is to kind of elicit these emotions with this scene. However he wants to do it um, yeah. so to me like that's one of the things I like about Wes Anderson is he's showing these scenes he you know he's getting these great performances out of these actors and then there's a song that comes in that kind of just um, really sort of emphasizes everything that's happening um, yeah. but I like that but it clearly you know it's a it's a personal personal taste thing. And then one thing I've noticed as I've gotten more into music, the hardcore music fans are <laughs> so crazy opinionated. Um like the fuck all oh, that band, I hate that fuck out. Uh, like that. <laughs> like that kind of shit. It's just like <laughs> that gets a little crazy. Yeah, we had our experience. So how I could tell my website is growing is we got our first shitty internet comment about a week ago, we'd been blessed with, you know, some nice feedback and some cool comments and stuff from friends. And then this random guy on an episode from like a year and a half, two years ago, comments saying, we're all gay. We like cock. This band's religious. They have millions of fans. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And pretty much just poo-pooing and pissing all over everything. And I'm like, really, dude? Like, right. we're gay because we don't like this band. Okay, buddy. Where's your, po- oh, and you forgot punctuate. It like had the greatest tips, like homophobia, no punctuation and all cats. It's like, all right, good job, guy. But, but people get like that. Like I believe with music, you can't just say a band sucks because that's obviously not true. There's some semblance of talent if they're making records. What you can say is back up that opinion with, well, you know, the guy sings off key. All the songs sound the same. He doesn't know how to write interesting lyrics like reasons don't just go oh that band sucks man because that doesn't mean anything <laughs> right yeah and the other thing too that I, this definitely comes from doing you know 300 episodes of of a film podcast sure it's so much of it is what your personal taste is yep you know what I mean? And like, like every once in a while we find a movie that we, we don't like, like we were just all bagging on 50 shades of gray and you know, well, whatever. Well, cause it's 50 shades of gray. Like there's nothing redeemable about that. The book, the movie, <laughs> it's existence. 
<laughs> right. It's like every once in a while we'll find a movie that's fun to, to bag on, you know. Yeah, sure. Comedically. But so much of it is you know, I've just discovered in, in doing that show and talking to you know, having different guests with different opinions and stuff, you just go, Well, this movie, you know, it resonated with for me for these reasons and then a lot of it has to do with just me, where I'm coming from, where I was at that day, how I grew up, whatever. Yeah. Um and that's such a that's such a thing, but for some reason with music it does not people <laughs> fucking lose their shit over it. Well, I think also like we we rate albums week to week on a scale of one to five and we try and be you know, we try and be analytical about it, but ultimately if we have a specific taste, like if it's a country album and I hate country, it might still affect my opinion of it. You know, we try and not to, we try and rate it on the technicalities, but ultimately you know, you're human and you feel certain things for certain stuff. Yeah. Right. It's going to affect how you analyze it. And we always say like, we're just three guys reviewing music. Like if you don't like our opinion, great. Tell us why, you know, or go listen to it yourself and form your own, you know? Yeah. Like we're not saying this is the opinion. We think this band is shit and you should think it's shit too, you know, because that's not yeah. really helpful to anybody and nobody wants to listen to that. No, no. And if they keep complaining, tell them they'll go get their fucking free content the fuck somewhere else. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, that's the best is everyone's got an opinion about that thing that costs them nothing. But, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, like, um, my one of my final questions is about an actual movie that I saw recently, because unfortunately, I have not been to the movies as much as I'd like recently. Planning a wedding has eaten all of my time. So while I'm excited to get married, it's also a pain in the ass to plan one. Um, sure. The movie I saw recently was Jupiter Ascending. I was looking at your recent episodes to see if you guys have talked about it, and I didn't see it. Did you guys actually do an episode on Jupiter Ascending? No, nobody saw it. We just thought it all looked really stupid. <laughs> it, it was. It was all yeah. really stupid. Um, yeah, it was. I God, I had to go see some really stupid movie and then so Chris had to go either see that or Mordecai or but then he ended up seeing Fifty Shades of Grey uh, so I think, he, I think he paid his debt to society <laughs> yeah I mean he would have probably had more fun at Jupiter Ascending because the special effects and the design was awesome but the writing right. was toilet worthy like, of course but the, some of the stuff they made Sean Bean say like I love Sean Bean in anything he's in just about and like some of the lines they made him utter, like there's an actual conversation where Mila Kunis's character has bees flying around her and they're not attacking her. Like they were swarming and then they stop and Sean Bean goes, they recognize royalty. Bees don't have emotions and they recognize your royalty, that you are true royalty. I'm sorry, what? Oh God, like I can't even, who, I... <laughs> yeah, that movie, the trailer looks dumb. The posters look dumb. Um, it, it, it just looks like, and there's all these, like everyone must so be regretting it. Like, you know, Eddie Redmayne, you know, is, is up for an Oscar and he must just be like, Oh fuck. Why does this have to come out now? <laughs> well, the best part about him in that movie is he was playing a classic cartoon villain in a different movie. Cause he wasn't, he didn't make any sense in that movie. Like he shouted everything and overreacted and, and it just didn't make sense. Like, honestly, the most captivating thing about the whole movie, and I hate myself for saying this, was Channing Tatum. Like, he was actually entertaining. He he was actually fun to watch in the action scenes and was actually entertaining. So that tells you how piss poor the rest of it was. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. I it's like they, I bet you they all just want it to go away. Probably. It's like the most fun I had not liking a movie, pretty much. Because, <laughs> again, there, there's so much action, and it was pretty. So, you know, I and I love – I'm a sci-fi nerd, so I love spaceships and all that stuff. And their spaceships really didn't look like anything else I'd seen before. So it was original-looking right. stuff. So I had a ton of fun, but me and my, my friend walk out of it and kind of look at each other and go, so what did you think? I don't know. No idea. And that's never a good sign when you can't immediately identify how you feel about something like at all, like not even anger or something. That's a problem. That's good. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me, Graham, today. Um, it's been a pleasure. I'm a huge, huge fan of your comedy and again of the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time um, touring. Um, is there any stuff you want to, um, you know, 
promote while you have the audience's ears stuff coming up? Yeah. Um, you know, if they, all my tour dates and my Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that are, uh, at Graham Um, and then of course our podcast is comedy film nerds. You can get that on iTunes or comedy film And, um, uh, earbuds, the podcasting documentary. We also have a, uh, that's also on Twitter and, and Facebook and all that. And they're going to be releasing updates and trailers and stuff coming up soon. We're in post-production that'll be done this summer. That's awesome. And then of course, uh, tickets on sale for the fourth um, annual Los Angeles Podcast Festival, September 18th to the 20th at the Self Hotel in Beverly Hills. And that you can get tickets for that and info on that at uh, LAPodfest.com. Awesome. Thank you again for taking the time. You're a funny man, and I appreciate the last. I appreciate the time. Um, this is a bi-weekly show, and I have a few other episodes banked, so it's going to be probably about a month before it goes up, but... I will definitely put links to the movie, you know, stuff about the movie, about the podcast, everything in the show notes. And I'll shoot you a Facebook message with the actual link once it's out. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Graham. Have a great night. All right, buddy. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed these interviews, please subscribe to this and the Crash Chords podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post in the comment area below each post. And keep the discussion going, because remember, music is life, and life is good.